I didn't see the warning th signs, but thankfully I didn't die either. It was a cool summer evening, and I decided that I was going to go to the public transit station to take the bus home, which is just a few miles away. And so I waited inside of this packed bus shelter with so many people crammed inside of it that, that you were sharing shoulder space and you were practically breathing on the person next to you. The suspicious guy who was sharing shoulder space with me was wearing a trench coat and exuded sketchy, which should have been the first warning sign for me. And as I was kind of just spacing out, waiting for the bus to come, I was staring off into the distance, and then I heard the screeching of tires like that before an accident. And so naturally, that caught my attention, so I looked down the way to see what the pileup was or what the accident was, but instead of a pileup, I saw a police blockade. And I thought, oh, this is exciting. And I, I thought, this is, this is kind of weird, though. That should have been my second warning sign. And then the second happened. The same thing happened over here on this side of the street. Uh, police had stopped, and they blocked this side of the street off until there was about a dozen or so police officers on both sides of the street. And I thought, something's really going down here. This is really exciting. That was until the police drew their guns and they pointed them at our bus shelter. And I thought, uh oh, <laughs> this is not good. And they said over the mic, come out with your hands up. I mean, talk about an adrenaline rush. I mean, my heart stopped. I, I've never had a gun pulled out on me before. I mean, it was something like out of a movie. And my heart just began to race, and I thought, man, somebody needs to step forward and confess, because I don't want to get shot. And then they spoke again over the mic, come out with your hands up, and not a soul moved. Nobody even flinched. My anxiety levels tripled. They just went, they went through the roof, and I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe they caught me illegally walking across the street. Maybe this is because I jaywalked or something. And so about three more times they said, come out with your hands up. And I thought, man, I don't want to get shot today. So I, I, I was getting ready to step forward and say, guys, look, I, I confess, I illegally walked across the street. And, and just then the guy who was sharing shoulder space with me he stepped forward, and he walked toward the police. And it was right then the, the police officers, a crew of them, rushed over in his direction with their guns drawn, and they brought him to the ground. And while this man was face down on the pavement, they pulled out of his trench coat an axe. And I think nearly everybody in the bus shelter wet themselves at the site. And I thought... How did I not see the signs? How did I not pay attention to the warning signs? And I have no idea to this day what that man did with that axe, but it was clearly severe enough to get an entire police task force to block the streets and to take him down. And I'm just thankful that I did not die for the things that I did not see. Have you ever had something in your life happen? that you thought, man, I should have seen this coming. Where you, 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 something happened and then afterward you just think, I should have seen the warning sign. It can happen in virtually any life situation, from corruption in the workplace to life-controlling addictions, from betrayal of a friend to the bitterness that robs you of joy. And whether you are a person who can look back on life and say, man, I should have seen that coming. Or you can't. You will be one day. And it's true individually that we can get blindsided in life. It's true spiritually. And it's true corporately. Most of the time, it doesn't come in the form with a man with an axe standing beside you. But oftentimes, it's the, it's the little things, it's the small things that we 
overlook, that we let slide, that grow into a big enough deal that can grow out of control and cause damage that can seem irreversible unless you pay attention to the warning sign. And so today I want to talk about spiritual healthiness. And I want to talk about the warning signs that we should pay attention to before they cause damage, before they attack. And since this passage that we are looking at today is talking about the church specifically, we will look at a healthy church, what that is like. But don't think just because we are talking about the church that this doesn't apply to you individually. Because it does. It transfers over to our lives. And I'll do my best to draw the connection here. But for now, let me cue you, on, cue you in on where we're going today. Since we're talking about health, it's important that we make clear what we mean by that, what we mean by a healthy church, and what that looks like practically for each and every one of us. And so the first thing, here, here's how Paul defines a healthy church according to Ephesians chapter 4. A healthy church is a ministering church. A healthy church is a ministering church. A little bit of background will kind of help out with this. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, Paul covers a lot of ground. And to be honest, there's probably like three sermons packed into this passage. So much is, is laid out here that it would be impossible to cover in 30, 40 minutes of time. And so today I want to unpack the main idea, the big idea that Paul is getting at here. And so Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. Paul says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. This is the picture of, the, of a healthy church. That a healthy church is a ministering church. And when we unpack this passage we see three key themes throughout this passage. We see love, unity, and maturity. Love, unity, and maturity. And chapter 4 changes the trajectory of this letter. Chapters 1 through 3 is about who we are. And the rest of the chapters moving forward are about how we are now to live because of who we are. And he does so. He changes the direction of the letter by saying this in verse 1 and 2. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The first thing that he does here is he urges us to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. The calling that, that Jesus that placed on our life to respond to the gospel, to accept him. That, that we would surrender our lives, that the call that we are His holy people, that we, are, that we are His children. And for those of you who care about the, this sort of Greeky stuff, the word that he uses here for urge is the word parakaleo. And what this word means is it means Paul is saying, I exhort you, I beg you. And so what he's not saying is, hey guys, I want you, I want you to pay attention. I want you to know that what I'm about to say is like really important. I want you to, I want you to pay attention because this, this is a good insight. This is, this is encouraging. No, what he's saying is, guys, look, I am on my knees. I am begging you. Listen, pay attention. Do this. That's the tone. Paul is begging. So what is he begging us to do? To live a life worthy of the calling we've received that it's not just enough to respond, but it's to live up to, to live a worthy way. So how do we do that? Well, he continues in verse 3. He says this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
We live a, a worthy of our calling by keeping the unity of the Spirit. Keep the unity of the Spirit. And there's, I think, a couple things to note about unity here. The first is unity is given, not created. Unity is given, not created. That God gave us unity, people did not create unity. That unity is a gift from God that has been given to us through His Spirit in us. But it is our responsibility, it is the children of God's responsibility to make sure that we keep unity, that we recover unity, that unity is front and center uh, in our lives with Christians and with churches, that unity should be at the, the, the epicenter of us, that it is the most important thing, that it is a gift that has been given to us to be kept. Now, given what Paul has previously said about God bringing two radically diverse groups, and you don't get any more diverse than Jews and Gentiles, and both of these groups are brought into one family through Jesus. And it's worth noting that our basic impulse as humans is not unity. That as humans left to our own demise, it is always separation, it is always disunity, it is always choosing bitterness, over healing. It is always that way. And it is the work of God to bring unity. It is the work of God in us that allows us to continually to pursue unity. And we need God's Spirit to do that. And I do not believe that when Paul wrote this to the church, that he had like a church in mind when he wrote this. He had a group of churches, but I also think that Paul was imagining, what are the churches throughout the ages going to know? And so he wrote that with that in mind. And I think it's important for us as Christians to not see other churches as opposing enemies or as the, the people worth reaching, but as brothers and sisters in Christ who are worth pursuing unity with. Now, the other things that he says about unity is that it should be the utmost important to us. That unity should be the utmost important to us. That unity, when you look at all of the things that we can do, that we can live for as Christians, that unity should be the most important thing in our lives. That it always comes back to that. That we should be passionate, that we should be zealous to make unity our goal, even when it seems impossible. That we should make unity the most important thing, even when we are hurt that we should make unity the most important thing, even when we feel betrayed, even when we encounter difficult people, even when we encounter different people. And so how do we do that? Peace. Paul said that this happens through the bond of peace. That peace is the key. That unity is maintained in peace. And after he tells us that living a life worthy of our calling requires unity, requires us to keep unity that has been given to us, and that unity is maintained through peace, he spends the next couple of verses on the common unity that we now have in Jesus. And here's what he says in verse 4. He says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And each of these items that he lists here reminds them of the common unity that they now have. It's the unity that that when they look at all the things that are different between Jew and Gentile, Paul is saying, look, here's the thing that you guys have in common. Here's the unity that you have. But it's not just to say this is what you have in common, but it's also a call to maintain that unity. Each of these items here is not just a a reminder of their unity, but a call for them to continually live up to that, to live a life worthy of the calling they've received. And the same is true for us. The same is true for us here and beyond these walls. God has given us a a common unity with other Christians, and God calls us to live up to the unity that he has given us, to live up to that, to to keep that. And here we see this theme of unity in the first 16 verses, but we also see two other things. 
We see love and we see maturity. Verse 13. He says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then verse 15, he says this. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We see the three emphasis in this passage, love, unity, and maturity. And so what's maturity? Well, the, the word that Paul uses here in verse 13 is the word stature, and it typically describes somebody who has come of age, or it describes the physical stature, right? They they're well built, right? It just, it kind of describes that. But here, Paul is using it figuratively to describe a person who is, grows up spiritually, somebody who is Christ-like, somebody who looks like Jesus. And so a mature person is somebody who acts and speaks like Jesus. And you will always notice a spiritually mature person by how much they reflect Jesus in their life, not how much they know about Jesus. And if we could draw all of this together, we get a picture of a healthy church. A healthy church. A, a church is a, is a church that is ministering. Ministering in love for unity and maturity. That everything we do is for, um, is ministering to others in love. It is motivated, it is prompted, it is driven by a desire for love with the two goals of unity and maturity, of unity, pursuing unity with each other, but it's also growing people up. It is growing people to look more and more like Jesus. And so what do we mean by ministry? What does that look like? Uh, Here is where I think the rubber meets the road. Here's where all this love, unity, and maturity, I think, makes the best sense. And in here is where I believe that we find not just the warning signs of unhealthiness, but the solution to healthiness, the warning signs to unhealthiness and the solution to healthiness. Here's what Paul says in verse 11. And he, being Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why did Jesus give these people to the church? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Paul mentions five, maybe four groups here. He says the the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and some think that this next group, pastors and teachers, is actually one group. So it's really pastor-teacher. And whether or not there is a distinction there between pastors and teachers or what the specific identity is of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, Their purpose is as clear as day. The reason God gives the the pastors, the, the, the prophets, the evangelists, the apostles, the teachers to the church is to equip the saints. That's all of you guys for the work of ministry. And this, I think, is the keynote difference between being a healthy and being unhealthy between living biblically and then living like a consumer. When you look at a healthy church versus an unhealthy church, here's one of the things that you will always see. Every unhealthy church has ministers ministering. Every unhealthy church has ministers ministering. That if you walk into any church, you're likely to see um, somebody who is ministering, somebody who is is going um, and doing all of of the work of ministry. You'll always see that. And if you think about it, the only churches that don't have ministers ministering are usually churches that are dying or dead. But before a church gets there, it usually goes through a process of unhealthiness and allowing those warning signs to go on by, unnoticed. And it's possible, it's possible to have a large church with a fully staffed church and be an unhealthy church, and it's possible to have a small church with a minister and be an unhealthy church. 
It is possible, and it doesn't matter the size. And so while every unhealthy church has ministers ministering, every healthy church is a church that ministers. Every unhealthy church is a church that ministers. And there is a world of difference between these two. One relies on a person in a position to minister to them, and the other sees the call and the responsibility to minister to others. Uh, churches have ministers, but healthy churches are churches that are ministering churches. The point is not that there would be a person or there would be a handful of people who function as the primary ministers of a church doing the bulk of the ministry in the church. The point is that the church would equip the people in the church to do ministry to one another. That's what Paul means here. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying that that until ministry becomes an all-of-us thing, a collaborative effort, we will never grow toward love, unity, and maturity. And look at how he sums it up in verse 16. He says, From whom the whole body joined and held together unity by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Every joint, every part, uh, what he's talking about, he's talking about every Christian, every disciple of Jesus, every person who has surrendered and given their life to Christ, every part. And look what he says. He says, unity is only maintained by every person doing their part. And when every part is carrying out ministry, when every part is equipped for ministry, then unity is possible. And it can be built up in love. That God has gifted, God has equipped, God has given you gifts for ministry. This is the vision, this is the call of a healthy church. And this is the primary difference between thinking like a consumer and thinking like a disciple of Jesus. A consumer thinks the church exists to meet my needs. The leadership exists to minister to me. A disciple of Jesus thinks I am a part of the church and I'm called to minister. A disciple thinks the leadership exists to equip me to do ministry. And this is God's job description for every church across the globe, throughout all generations. The point is not that we would have somebody being the primary uh, caregiver, minister of the church, shepherding every person, but that the whole church would, be, uh, would take a part and participate in ministering to one another, that we would all take it on ourselves to minister to each other. The goal is that the entire Christian community would have a culture that prioritizes ministering and caring for one another. So, do you feel lost on how to do that? Well, that's why Paul stresses, this is why God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's why God has given leaders to the church to help equip, to help instruct, to help teach, to help guide so the church could minister. And what this means on a practical level is that as the church grows, as our church grows toward health, as our church grows in reaching people for Jesus, there will be more people who need care. Granted, you add more people, there's more needs. There will be more people who need to be visited in the hospital, more people who are going to be homebound needing needing visits. There are going to be more people who are going to need to be instructed on what the gospel is, how to read your Bible, how to pray, how how to be discipled, how to reach out in faith. There's going to be an increase in that as more people come to know Jesus, as more people come into our church. And the solution is not hire more people to meet those needs. The solution is to empower and to equip the church to minister. And for this to happen, there has to be a shift in thinking. As Jesus said, I did not come 
to be served but to serve. And there has to be a shift at that level of not seeing the, the church as a people who is to meet my needs to serve me, but me as one of God's child called to serve, called to minister. So how do we minister? And doesn't that, I mean, doesn't that seem overwhelming? From my experience as a pastor and from the wisdom that has been passed down to me from other wise mentors in my life, 98%, 98% of ministering is just having somebody who cares. 98% of ministering is having somebody in your life who cares. It is being a caring person. A lot of times people just want to be loved and be cared for. A lot of times people just want to know, do you notice me? Or did I fall through the cracks? And some of the most profound ways to minister to somebody is writing a card like, hey, I, I, I noticed that you were sick this week. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Hey, it's your birthday, and I just wanted to send you a birthday card. It's giving them a call and saying, hey, I, I noticed you weren't here, and we, we missed you. It, it's paying somebody a visit. You notice that somebody's in the hospital, and you just, you just go visit them, and you, you let them know that you are there, that you let them know that you care for them, that you are praying for them. It's, it's, it's seeing somebody who's, who's kind of starting to wander away, wander off the path, and you call them, and you say, hey, look, I, I know, it looks like things aren't going well. Let's grab coffee. Let's talk. To let somebody know that you are there in the tough times and in the good times. And a lot of times, having somebody who cares is enough. It is healing and it is powerful. And second, this is where life groups come into play. This is where joining life groups becomes so important. One of the biggest benefits to being a, a part of a life group is that as a group, you are able to minister to and love one another in powerful and in practical ways. Groups provide the best way for you to really be cared for and for you to really care for others. It becomes it's such a critical place for you to be known and for others to know you. And chances are highly likely that if you are here this morning and you don't feel like anybody cares for you, if you feel like nobody really knows you, it, it, it might be because you're not a part of a smaller group. So, what are the warning signs? I think there are three major warning signs. If a healthy church is a ministering church, then a warning sign is a greater focus inward instead of outward. That individually, there's a greater focus on my life, on my spirituality, and less of an outward focus. There's more of a focus on who is here instead of who to reach. I think that's one warning sign. A second, a healthy church, if, if, if it ministers out of love, then a warning sign is a lack of involvement, a lack of engagement. There's fewer and fewer and fewer people who are willing to minister. There's fewer and fewer people who are wanting to be involved, who are wanting to engage. A third, I think if a healthy church prioritizes unity, then a warning sign is an increase in unresolved conflicts. An increase in unresolved conflicts. Any, any group, any, any, any individual, any relationship always has conflicts. Where the unhealth is, is when conflicts are avoided, when conflicts are neglected, and it's, it's there that you find things that kind of grow out of control, that, that some people just let something rest for so long that it explodes. The difference between a healthy church and an unhealthy church as conflicts are resolved. Now here is how I think this carries over to our personal lives. If you want to be a healthy employee, if you want to be a healthy employer, if you want to be a healthy father, mother, son, daughter, coach, friend, if you want to be a healthy self, then you cannot make your life about you. If life is all about you, then nobody will want to be around you. Caring for others and serving others is not just something to do because it feels right. It's not just something to do because it, it, it makes you feel like you have purpose. It's because that's how God wired you. God made you to be other-focused, to be outward-focused, to care for others, to make life 
about other people. And when we do that, life just simply makes sense. Life just works better because that's how God made us. And the way that we can truly accomplish that is to genuinely value the people around you, to genuinely value the people in your life. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is through pursuing unity and reconciliation. I mean, how much would it mean to you? How much would it mean to you if, say, you got in a heated argument with somebody that you know, somebody you respect, somebody you love, say this is your spouse, say this is your boss, say this is your kid, say this is your friend, and you got in this heated argument that resulted in both of you walking away, and the other person came back to you and they said, hey, you know what, I value our marriage more than this. I value your role here in the, this office more than this disagreement. I value our friendship more than this situation. I value our relationship. And I want to work things through. How much would that mean to you? That would mean the world, wouldn't it? That would mean so much to see that somebody in your life value unity. Pursuing a life that ministers, that cares for others in love, for unity and maturity is not just a sign of health for churches, it's a sign of health for people, for individuals. And here's the bottom line. We will mess this up. You will mess this up. I will mess this up. We will say things that will make people angry. We will do things that tick people off. We will make mistakes. We will harbor bitterness instead of love. We will pursue being right instead of pursuing unity. And this is where Jesus' death is so central. It is so central to everything we do. It is so central to everything we believe because Jesus died on the cross not because we were perfect, not because we looked good, not because we said the right things or we did the right things, but because we were imperfect. Jesus died on the cross not because we were perfect, but because we messed up and we keep messing things up. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died for our sins so that we would be forgiven and we could be forgiven when we do mess up. That God gives grace in place of our shortcomings and he gifts unity in place of disunity. And if you want to live a life that God has called you to live, to the calling that God has given you, if you want to live a life that is worthy of the calling, it requires not once but daily us to surrender to God's leading in our life. And a life led by God will always lead toward spiritual health. A life that is surrendered to God and you say, God, you lead my life will always lead in the right direction. But it requires diligence. It requires a pursuit of love, unity, and maturity. So the question is, Are you willing to pursue that for yourself? Are you willing to prioritize and put unity above all else? Are you willing to minister to others? And here in just a, here in just a moment, I'd like to invite the team to come forward. Here in just a moment, we get to remember and to celebrate what Jesus did for us that on the cross, Jesus took all of our mistakes, he took all of our mess, all of our muck, all of our mire, that through him and through him alone, we have the forgiveness, we have the promise that our sins have been dealt with, they have been taken care of, and that we can, we can come here and we can worship, we can celebrate, we can know that God gives us grace in place of guilt, in place of our mistakes. And so use this song to prepare your heart for communion. Use this song uh, to prepare yourself for God.